A shadowy figure stalks their prey from the darkness of a dimly lit room. The light bleeds through the door, revealing the corpse of Mr. Leo Kopernick, played by the lovely Adrian Brody. Just in case you were busy following the antics of our mystery murderer, we kept track of a handful of things that you might have missed and see how they run. We'll be vague with the end, so please keep the secret of who done it locked in your heart. And beware of some potential spoilers. With all that being said, let's go ahead and dive right into it. Let's begin with a given. The name of this movie comes from the nursery rhyme Three Blind Mice, a rather fitting name for a variety of reasons. First off, the name of the play in the movie is Mousetrap by Agatha Christie, which this movie does not take for granted. The mouse and rat references are abundant. Secondly, Agatha herself had an affinity for naming her books after nursery rhymes, from the mouse-themed Hickory Dickory Dock to One Two Buckle My Shoe. The prolific mystery writer was rather fond of turning the innocent into the macabre. And thirdly, as the writer Mark Chappell put it in an interview with Entertainment Weekly, we had a lot of clever ones and brilliant ones, but none of them worked as well as this one. When you have just the name that sticks, it's like striking gold. No need to try again. See How They Run is a love letter to Agatha Christie, whodunits, and the theater. Not just because there's a murder involving a play. For example, did you catch this quick reference to Hamlet? The line, it's not Hamlet, is at the expense of their production, yes, but the actual play the royalty watch in the iconic Shakespearean play is also called Mousetrap. A play within a movie directly referencing a play within a play is a bit too meta for us to unpack, and the Shakespeare connections don't end there, as a handful of cast members have appeared in adaptations of the Bard's finest work. And while it's entirely speculatory, the performer in the audition lineup is dressed in almost Shakespearean garb, so that could very well be a further nod to the Bard. Wanting to set itself apart from actual works of Agatha Christie, the movie makes a point to not be too heavy-handed with its adoration of her work. If it's not pertinent to the scene, any reference to the writer or her works is sly or easily written off. However, there are a few examples where the movie rips straight from other works. Chappelle explains, Mervyn Cocker Norris, the writer, his apartment is in the same building as David Suchet's Perot. Hercule Perot is a detective thought up by Agatha Christie. He has gone on to inspire characters like Adrian Monk and basically any overly tidy detective. This particular version in question was on air for 24 years, finally ending in 2013. The case has a little connection to that show as well. Gregory Cox, who plays Major Metcalf in the movie, also appears in the TV show as a corner. A nice hidden detail for us hardcore murder fans. Murder mystery, that is. A contract isn't a law, but may as well be treated as such. The clause that Petulia Spencer promised isn't important is still in effect today. If you haven't heard of Mousetrap before this movie, then you've missed out on the theater's longest running mystery to date. The play within the movie is in fact a real production, which has yet to be made out of a movie due to its 52 year running spree having almost never left production. There was a small break at the beginning of the pandemic, but the show must go on. And at the end of every show, the murderer asks the audience to not spoil the ending for those who haven't seen it yet. Avengers have nothing on Agatha Christie. Not counting all the parts that are completely fabricated for a viewing pleasure, See How They Run was rather accurate with its portrayal of the original cast of Mousetrap, to an extent. Harris Dickinson plays the mouthy Dickie Attenborough. The real late great actor really did play the Detective Trotter. He later went on to play Judge Arthur Cannon in another Agatha Christie work, so we're watching Harris Dickinson play Richard Attenborough playing Detective Trotter, blurring the lines in this movie between fiction and reality, which helps keep the audience at the edge of their seats. When you know the events are fake, but that some of the people are real, narrowing down the culprit is just a little bit trickier. Our search down the list of potential murders leads us naturally to the producer. If you are as much of a film buff as Constable Stalker, the name John Wolfe may sound familiar. This mid-century producer obsessed with promises had his hand in a lot of pies at the time, but the one you may be the most familiar with, beyond the posters on his wall and Stalker's expo dump, is Oliver, a musical film based on the musical based on the Charles Dickens novel Oliver Twist. This man must have had a serious need to adapt plays. Beyond that, everything else that Stalker talks about him is completely true, though he never did get the rights to Mousetrap, by the way. But don't feel too bad for him, as Oliver won five Oscars and two Golden Globes, which seems like a better deal if you ask me. Movie makers love to tease their endings in plain sight, from Moral Oral ending every episode with a claymation scene, to Reservoir Dogs missing tip in the beginning. If you're sharp, you can sometimes pick up on what the people behind the camera have to say about where the production is going. 
See how they run takes this a bit more literally. In Norris's forbidden flashback, Copernic is pitching his altered ending for the Mousetrap movie. However, the storyboards he is using will look awfully familiar near the end of the movie. Meaning, of course, he is pitching the end of the actual movie that you're watching. This scene was a cause of strife for director Tom George. He wanted to shoot the climax first so that the storyboards for this scene would be done and available to use in the earlier shot. Due to a few reasons, this was not possible, so they ended up storyboarding both scenes to keep things as close as possible. A tough compromise for a pretty great payoff. Jumping to the bustling station, we meet Commissioner Harold Scott, the publicity-seeking desk jockey played by Tim Key. He isn't the most important character, being only in a handful of scenes and missing in most important ones. But if it weren't for his command, then Stalker wouldn't be assigned to Stoppard, and we'd miss out on their constant witty banter. Okay, maybe not. But the movie uses him mostly for comedic effect, being portrayed as conceited and out of touch with real police work. His real-life counterpart was more or less known for his administrative abilities. He was only the second commissioner to have been missing that police background. A small nod to a real person in history. His stewardship during the 1950s actually saw an increase in forensic science, which helped lead to closing cases like the next one on our list. Before we continue, I'd like to warn you, dear viewers, the topics we're about to discuss are both real and gruesome. Please be prepared as we talk about the Rillington Place murders. It is odd that only two officers are working on Kaepernick's murder. The movie explains that all other resources are going to the potential serial killer at Rillington, a clear reference to the real-life murders that took place at 10 Rillington Place. John Reginald Halliday Christie strangled eight people while living in his flat, and after he had moved, the bodies of three of the said victims were found in a recess behind the wallpaper. His terror lasted for two years longer than Harold Scott was commissioner, coincidentally. Finally ending with his arrest and execution in 1953, horrific and bone-chilling, but the references don't end there. See, this murderous monster inspired a movie, the 1971 10 Rillington Place. The real movie stars a familiar face that we've already talked about, Richard Attenborough himself. That's right, he jumped from detective to horrendous murderer in only 20 years. Little black books are sewn across media as a sign of promiscuous behavior or murder's intent. Little fun fact, the first reference to one is all the way back in the 1400s, when it was used to keep track of who was and wasn't in favor with the king. In the movie, Copernic's black book is filled with the names of women who he has had a relation with, if you know what I mean. As Stalker calls each one trying to find the plain, homely-looking woman, she passes by two very distinct names, Beryl and Geraldine. Neither are much help, unfortunately, but they act as a subtle nod back to the other movie about that other murder. Who else is simply a throwaway reference, you ask? Well, the forever tipsy Stoppard is definitely a candidate. Inspector Stoppard's name is strikingly similar to that of playwright Sir Tom Stoppard. More than a coincidence, I assure you. While describing Copernic to the aforementioned inspector, Sheila Slim says he was a real hound inspector. Hidden in that rather true statement about the dearly departed, is a name drop more obvious than a ski to the face. Stoppard wrote a play called The Real Inspector Hound, in which two critics are not amused by the whodunit on stage, and end up accidentally in one themselves. It hits a little close to home in this movie all about plays in movies, and people playing out said plays, but it's a fun little line that also comes with a recommendation. How nice. We're not done yet, though. Names are a wonderful way to pay homage, and this movie understands the assignment better than most. Without spoiling too much, at one point in the movie, Stopper tells Stalker he's going to the dentist during a semi-stakeout. She runs across the city and finds him and ends up at a dentist office right next to the bar where he's been drinking. But in her frantic foraging for her partner, we get a nice close-up of all the dentists that she buzzes, most of which are names of actual dentists used in novels, including that of Norman Gale, a dentist from the novel Death in the Clouds. If we take that this dentist is the same one from the book, he doesn't have too long left in the world, as his death is what kickstarts that story. Just remember that the next time your dentist forgets to give you Novocaine when drilling out your molars. If Home Alone 2 tells us anything, it's that you should really try to respect your hotel staff, especially when you're staying at one of the swankiest hotels in the area. Copperdick finds himself staying at the Savory on the producer's dime, after a mishap which gives him leverage over the man, a scene used to further the motives for Stoppard, Wolf, and Norris. But with the mess he left, the hotel staff had more than enough reason to off the director. And that brings us to the Savory Butler, 
If you were paying attention earlier, this often mistaken for French butler should look a lot like the iconic PQ Perot. From his mustache to his Belgian accent being mistaken for French, he seems almost ripped from the pages of Murder on the Orient Express. He may not be as important as other staff members in this movie, though if he were, it could stand to reason that the murderer wouldn't be able to get a second chance. Leading us nicely to this small throwaway line during the investigation, the idea that the entire cast did it suggests in the early stages of Stoppard and Stalker's fact-finding. It is most likely an in-universe reference to Agatha Christie as well. If you didn't know, and spoilers for one of the most well-regarded mysteries of all time, in Murder on the Orient Express, every guest on the train was responsible for Ratchet's death. When the train is caught in the snow, the entire cast directed by his victim's mother plot and kill the gangster, leading to a conflicting collection of evidence that doesn't point to just one person. A nice red herring when you can't rule out any specific culprit. But as far as Stoppard and Stalker are aware, every actor in the audience is capable of murder. Maybe even more so than those on that train. Attenborough has a stroke of genius after he is lightly questioned by our crime-fighting duo when he notices, and guesses how, Stoppard's slight limp happened. Innocuous at first, but this little clue sets up two very fun details later on in the movie. First, Attenborough is the detective in Mousetrap. His deducing of Stoppard's war wound feels very reminiscent of Sherlock Holmes deducing Watson fought in Afghanistan. Beyond that, it sets up a wonderful case of mistaken identity later on. See, Attenborough chooses to use Stoppard's limp in the play to flesh out his detective character. And when a chase ensues between Stoppard, Stalker, and a mysterious third person, Attenborough is tackled because he is dressed like our esteemed detective. As an audience member, we have been primed to expect these two men to appear more similar because of that first deduction. It's a nice piece of foreshadowing, but if I say those two names one more time, my jaw is going to lock in protest. If you've made it this far, I hope you've already sat and watched this carefully crafted caper, because the next detail gives away a major plot point for the end. After a cast has been invited to the house of Agatha Christie, played by Shirley Henderson, they are kept hostage inside of her lounge. In order to save everybody, Christie hides a dose of strychnine in tea she plans to give their captive. Strychnine is an extremely common poison you've seen thousands of times. It's also a favorite of Agatha Christie, as half of her deaths involve the poison in some way. Why does she like to use it? It might be due to its odorless and tasteless qualities. Or maybe she just wasn't a fan of rats. Oh, in case you didn't know, strychnine is extremely common as a pesticide for rodents. And I will say that after doing research for this list, the writer is most definitely on some watch list somewhere. Don't worry, we wouldn't free you yet. Does Christie's lounge look familiar to you? Well, it should. Her lounge is almost one for one to the set of Mousetrap, down to the placement of the couch and framing of the scene. Of course, this is just to further expand on the relationship the killer has to the play, but it's also a nice callback to an earlier gag, as the last shot of the movie before the narrator kicks back in is of course recreating the Copernic pitch from earlier on in the movie, down to the music choice for the scene. Now, hear me out, Agatha Christie is not the killer in this movie, but she is arguably the foundation for it. Her work and involvement in certain events leads to the circumstances that led to Copernic's death. So could her lounge mirroring that of the stage be a way to address the engineering role she plays in the grand scheme? A question that's fun to think about during our eventual rewatch of this movie. Okay, now we're here for those deep cuts. The small references to books and movies that you may not have considered. Do you remember when the killer was caught because of the way they tied their shoe? Attenborough was dead wrong with his guess, but he brought up an interesting idea. So after a little digging, the story of the Dutch shoelace mystery came to view. Published in 1931, it details the mystery of a dead doctor and an operating theater filled with suspects. A fake limp and a shoelace led the reader to find who committed the strange strangling. A great book, and another small connection this movie makes with a lesser known mystery story. This movie pulls its ideas from all over the genre, so it's refreshing to see and find the little inspirations the crew had along the way. Getting into real spoiler territory here, so please continue watching at your own peril. Why? Well, a key suspect is going to be knocked off your clue list. In the actual play Mousetrap, the suspects start to accuse Detective Trotter of the murder himself. A wonderfully tense scene as we in the audience don't fully know that he had not done it. The entire build-up to our climax and see how they run surrounds Stoppard being accused of the murders. And the movie does a great job slowly having us question the honesty of our Stoppard. But there is a slight issue with his motives. We get to see the homely woman in the aforementioned forbidden flashback. And we see Stoppard's ex-wife. All before he is wrongfully imprisoned and they are not the same person at all. Beyond this little detail, it's still simultaneously spectacularly suspenseful and wonderfully reminiscent of the classic play. 
we round out this list right back at Agatha Christie herself. It's been 102 years this October since the publication of her first novel, The Mysterious Affair at Styles. In the opening of this movie, they have finished their 100th performance of Mousetrap. But the buck doesn't stop there. Now, because the play is run two more times in the runtime of the movie, one before and after the climactic scene, meaning that by the time we are officially accomplices to murder, Mousetrap had 102 performances. What a great and extremely subtle way to honor the legacy of the Countess of Crime, Agatha Christie. And that's all we have for now. To conclude our little venture into the murky world of murder and mayhem, remember that despite how fun it may be, spoiling the end for others can rob them of the experience. So please, once more, keep the secrets of the whodunit locked in your heart. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Screen Rant, and have a wonderful day.